Hi everybody, welcome to our special headline Q&A session for Salisbury 2020's Digital Big Weekend. Uh, we're very excited to be here with Phil Harding, who's um, an archaeologist from Time Team and Salisbury-based company Wessex Archaeology, who will be answering the questions that you've been sending in over the past week. So thank you very much for all of those questions. Uh, Phil, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. I mean, it's just nice to be talking to people who, well, a lot of them will be Salisbury residents, I hope, but also people on a wider scale. So yeah, let's get on with it. Yeah, great. So if we dive right in. So first question, uh, this is about you and, and your archaeological experience. So what yeah. was the first ever archaeological dig that you ever went on? Uh, oh, that's an easy one. Uh, I was eight years old and it was uh, up near Woodford. I can. I went back there about two years ago just to kind of revisit it. I stood on the spot, I looked across and in the far, far distance was Stonehenge and I got, uh, a, well I've got here, um, a copy of the report and so many of the, the things that are enshrined in my brain um or actually in that in that report i love that report it was i was very very lucky to get hold of a copy of it um it really was a groundbreaking experience for me i didn't know what archaeology was in those days of course i didn't but some in there said that's what you're going to do phil and and there's some in there that inspired me and all the rest of it so yeah it was it was um it was a series of Bronze Age burial mounds. That's what it was. They'd all been ploughed flat. And I don't know. Uh, the thing I remember was the uh, cremation burials. There was cremation pits and they they were they were black in the white chalk. And as a, an eight year old, I couldn't understand what all this blackness was in the white chalk. And it took me years and years before I actually found out they were cremations. But yeah, that was my first ever dig. Wow. And um, and then nowadays, obviously, you're famous for being a flint specialist. So um, somebody else has asked a bit about that. So why why is it that you, you really love flints and what do they tell us about the past? I think, well, I mean, I suppose I've always been a prehistorian. I will always will will be a prehistorian. Um, I suppose I had this fascination as a kid with what I called the cavemen. Uh, the, you know, there was something remote about the Stone Age. It was always something special, or something, something that they did that that, that 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 we don't do anymore. It's so so remote. People living entirely making stone tools, and I mean, as a kid, I just used to walk around on the field picking up stones. In my imagination, they were. They were the axe heads of, of, of prehistoric people and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, OK, if I'm on God's wonderful geology called chalk, then there's flint everywhere. But I mean, the thing of it is, there's something in me that wants to do things. So although I fascinated by flints and I love studying flints and, and all the rest of it, I tell you what, there ain't nothing like making flint tools. That's really when you start getting into contact with with distant ancestors, because they went through exactly the same processes, mental processes that I do. And mm. I believe you me, anybody who does practical things knows that it's not the hands that do the practical things. It's the brain that does it. That's what that's what drives the, the hands to do what they have to do. And I've 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 looked at flint napping in prehistory and I've looked at, at, at flint napping and stone working in, in foreign countries. Mm. And even people who and people like New Guinea making axes and all the rest of it. I couldn't actually talk verbally to somebody making an axe in New Guinea, but I could speak to them in a technological way. I could watch them making a stone axe and I relate to them exactly the same way that they would. They could give me a piece of stone and said, here you are, Phil, 
get on and make an axe out of that. And I'd know how to do it. We speak a common language and I speak that common language with our ancestors. Wow, amazing. So a connection with the past for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think you really do get into the soul of people. And 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 sometimes it's not just the practicalities of it, the physical things of it. It's the spiritual thing as well. I know you. I mean, you. I know it sounds as though I'm going off on one, but it, I can quite understand when I pick up a block of flint and I say I am going to make an axe out of that block of flint. That axe is already in there in a funny sort of way, and what I've got to do is take away all the waste material and, and release the axe. Now, like I say, that might sound far fetched, but it is that it is that thought processes. And, and I mean, a potter would do the same thing. They would take a lump of clay. It's not just a lump of clay to them. They can visualize that pot in there before they've actually started to make it. A woodworker would take a piece of wood. They will visualize that wooden object before they start carving it. So it works exactly the same thing with, with, with flints. Amazing. And how long does it take you to create a finished um, flint tool? Um, how long's a piece of string, really? I mean, the, the most pleasant ones are the ones that have a, what I call economy of effort. I, I remember taking an axe head, making an axe head once. I've got it here in my room here. Oh, I wow. took this block of stone. Do you want to see it? Yeah. <laughs> go on then. I'll go away. Why not? <laughs> okay. Mm. Now that is not, that's not a, uh, that's not flint. That's green sand chert. But it makes exactly the same. It makes it works exactly the same as as flints. I made that axe. I think there was about seven or eight major removals. I just picked up the block of, of stone. I saw that axe head in that block of stone and about seven or eight blows. Amazing. I made the axe head and I remember showing it to a colleague of mine who, who was a, a, an, an authority on him and he said he said that is a hand axe it's got soul it's got the soul of it it's got the spirit of it that's what you got to do it's not just a block of stone it really is a, an object with a soul and a spirit to it mm, it's very beautiful as well oh you know gorgeous gorgeous absolutely gorgeous and funnily enough I, one of the things I've been doing, um, I've had a, an axe. Don't go away. <laughs> now, if you want, if you want some of this beautiful. Wow. Look at that. And that, and that the most beautiful thing. Amazing. How do you get it so smooth? I, I, this has been my coronavirus project. <laughs> <laughs> Your chap's got to have something to do when he's locked up at home. Now, I made that axe in 1979 and I've wow. never got round to grinding it and polishing it. And that's what I finally done. And I reckon that's the most beautiful. Oh, that is amazing. And it is, I mean, the colours and the stuff. Again, it's not flint. That's a stone from the Langdales in the Lake District. But just to think, I've had that axe 41 years. Wow. And I've never actually got round to finishing it. And it's took me now to this Bally virus job before I've actually done it. And I tell you what, it, it's beautiful. It, you know, and and... When you see something like that, you can quite understand how people revered objects like this in the past. You mm. can't you can't look at this without going, "Cool, that's nice," as it is. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a favourite type of rock to create your tools out of? Um, I suppose really. 
I'm not most most familiar with Flint. You you do get you do get familiar with 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 your raw materials. These all work slightly differently, slightly differently. The one that I don't really like is obsidian, the volcanic glass, because that is really like glass and that is so razor sharp, but it splinters up a lot. And when it splinters up, it just still goes into your hands and all the rest of it. And you get these little tiny fragments coming out if you ain't careful. Um, no, I mean, I'm still a flint man. I always will be a flint man. Obviously, you're very well known for your um, your time team uh, role. And um, how long were you part of time team for? 20 years. It was on. Wow. It was on for 20, 20 years. Um, there were 220 odd, I think, episodes. There are only two people that were on every single episode. Tony Robinson was one of them. And you were the other one. Thank you very much. <laughs> I tell you what, I was I was getting it, I was getting a bit shaky towards the end. I th kept thinking to myself, what happens if I something goes wrong right at the end? Could you imagine getting to that last one? There was one, we did a live one in uh, Ballsy Abbey in Norfolk um, and I spent all three days of the of the transmission uh, flat on me back in an ambulance on the side of the trench and and they used to get me out for when transmission time came and stand me in the trench I was the one condition I was not allowed to dig on that on that thing because I'd, I'd done a disc in me back and the consultant said to me, he said, you can go to the transmission, but on one condition. I said, what's the condition? No digging, he said. <laughs> and I thought, that's fair enough. And, and time team <laughs> is crazy. Time team got an ambulance and they took me, shipped me up from uh, London, where I was sort of convalescing. Um, took me up to, to Norfolk in the back of an ambulance. And then every day when we went on the transmission, the ambulance, local ambulance used to come and pick me up and take oh. me to the side. And I spent three days in the ambulance. <laughs> but I didn't miss. <laughs> well, that's dedication for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The time team, obviously, they the team came to Salisbury in 2008 to dig at the cathedral. Um, what did you find there? Did you, I, I know you were part of it. What did you, is there anything interesting from that date? Oh, good Lord. I mean, how can you not, you know, be, find it interesting when, when, when you're talking about Salisbury Cathedral? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we were looking at the uh, remains of the Beecham Chapel which is a small chapel that was on the, uh, what was it, southeast corner, right on the southeast corner of, of the, uh, uh, the east end of the, of the cathedral. Um, we did find um, a, a burial or two in there. Um, the thing I remember about that trench more than anything else was taking out uh, uh, there was a, a like a big pit in the middle of the trench which is quite a recent uh, it was a more modern feature and somebody dug a hole there uh, and so of course it was um quite modern so it was relatively easy to dig it out and um archaeologically not really important because it it's a, a later intrusion so it gives you the opportunity to see all the earlier layers exposed in the side of the hole mm -hmm. and we got down there and it was about i think it was about four foot uh deep and i remember getting to the bottom of it and the bottom of it was the gravel the Avon River gravels and I remember standing there, which I'll never forget it, standing there just seeing the water of the Avon just just pressing up round the side of my boots and I looked and I thought to myself this is probably somewhere near the bottom 
of the foundations of the cathedral and I turn round and I look right up and I could see the top of the cathedral, the top of the spire and I thought in one hit I'm like seeing from the bottom to the top and I always remember that it was a very I don't know almost a very emotional moment I'm probably one of the few people who've actually stood at the level of the bottom of the foundations you know that's really that's special cool. yeah um and then of course we we also excavated um the the foundations of the bell tower as well and that really was an opportunity to see just how substantial a building that was and what a tragic loss that it was ever allowed to be knocked down. I mean, it's back in the 1700s, so it didn't really make a lot of difference in those days. Um, but the thing I remember about that was the underneath the foundations of the bell tower, there was a little tiny ditch. And that ditch was chock-a-block with Purbeck marble chippings. And of course, being a stone worker, Purbeck marble, I mean, I, I work a slightly different stone in flint than somebody who works in limestone and, and Purbeck marble. But at the end of the day, we're all brethren under the same flag. We're all stone workers. And that allowed me to associate with the medieval stone workers who built the cathedral and I, 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 there was, there was, there was just chippings everywhere and I got a couple of chippings of Purbeck marble and that just links me in with my stone working ancestors who built the cathedral. <laughs> Silly really. <laughs> no, not at all, completely understandable I think. Um, and somebody's asked, uh, were there any digs that Time Team filmed which couldn't or were not bro broadcast in the end? And if so, why? <laughs> Bit of a controversial one, maybe. You've got to be joking. <laughs> the amount of money that it cost to make an episode, the last thing they could possibly do was bin an episode. No way. I mean, you know, you were talking about having 70 or 80 people on site, particularly towards the end. I mean, the numbers got bigger and bigger as we went on and we got more and more ambitious. But you were talking about 70 or 80 people. Now, a lot of those, some of those might have been local residents, but the most of them would be in hotels. So in other words, you were having hotel bills, you were having all the transport bills to get people there. You had to have caterers on site. You had to have generators and all the accoutrements to make mm. that sort of happen. You could not afford. And then, of course, all the all the preliminary research uh, fun, funds that went into to getting the backlog of the uh, the, the the background of the storyline. If you think they put all that money into that and then just shredded it, no way. <laughs> if we move now on to on to Salisbury, I know we've talked a, a, a yeah. bit about a uh, bit about it already, but um, so your career has spanned about fifty years now in Salisbury. Uh, well, my my, my my career is over fifty years uh, in Salisbury. I mean, I moved to the the city in nineteen eighty seven. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I. That's kind of like when it became home for me, if you like. Uh, and of course, um, <clears throat> the uh, embryonic Wessex archaeology called Trust for Wessex Archaeology, uh, that moved down here. We moved down here in about, what, 1980, I suppose it was, something like that. Um, so then I, I was coming down possibly to work. Yes, I was coming down to work and be based here. And then that, that's what made me decide to live here. And so mm. that's how come I come to be in Salisbury. But I've only just moved across the moved across Salisbury Plain. You know, I hitched up my wagon and <laughs> steered my old horse down back across the Salisbury Plain, across the prairies, fighting off the Indian attacks as we come down. It was a bit like that, and then I corralled in my in my little cabin here in Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> 
to someone said that their favorite place in uh in the area is walking up um at the neolithic and iron age site at uh, fixbury ring um do you have a favorite could you pinpoint a favorite historical place in salisbury or or wiltshire i think in salisbury um the place i really like to go to is clarendon palace um I mean, it's it's relatively accessible from the city, but in a lot of cases, it's relatively unknown and you can go up there and there's the medieval ruins up there. And um, it was the site of the constitution of Clarendon, Henry II, Thomas of Beckett and all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, we've we've got the the Magna Carta and we're justifiably proud of the Magna, Magna Carta in the uh, in the cathedral. Um, but some of those those basic rights of, of, of human uh, freedom and all the rest of it were actually sort of cut out at Clarendon. And I just love going up there and it's just kind of nice. You just get a superb view back across the city. Um, so I, I I do look going up to, to Clarendon. Uh, so that's the sort of that would be my my local one. Um, I suppose uh, going a little further afield in, in the county, the place I it's sort of like my spiritual home, if you like, is the Foyfield and Overton Down Nature Reserve up near Avebury between Marlborough and Avebury. And why is that so important? Well, because it is a, a, a Romano-British um, prehistoric landscape that's never been ploughed because of the sarsen stones, the big sarsen stones, they're all up there. But for me personally, of course, it's so spiritually important because that's where I started to dig, 1966 up there. And well, life changing venue that was life changing mm. and um and over your kind of your career in salisbury um is there is there a favorite thing that you've discovered or a favorite site that you've dug oh yes oh um <laughs> oh jigger that's a difficult one is, is it difficult um Am I allowed to have two that I've dug? Go on then. I've got to have two. two that I've dug. Yeah. Two that I've dug. One has to be Milford Hill, uh, the Godolphin School, simply because that's an old Stone Age site. It's one of the richest old Stone Age sites in um, in Wiltshire, um, of, of which it all extends all the way along Milford Hill. And we've got literally uh, well over a hundred axe heads, more or less like that. I mean, not in church, but they're 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 all flint axe heads. And I feel quite proud of the fact that myself and a geological colleague went up there, and it was a little bit of field work that we did up there that actually cracked what those deposits up there were 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 actually all about, and we found out that they were actually river gravels on the top of, of Milford Hill. And and that just seems just awesome that you've got gravel that's laid down by a river on the top of a hill and not the bottom of a hill. Um, because the river subsequently, you were talking uh, 300,000 years ago, something like that. Rivers cut down, but equally the land surface has risen up. And for, uh, well, since 1864 was the first hand axe that was found on Milford Hill. And so, um, yeah, well over 100 and 150, 160 years, people have pondered about how the gravels got there and how the uh, stone axe heads got there. And I feel a great sense of achievement and cracking that one. So that would have to be one excavation. And then I guess the other one would have to be the excavations I did in the Vanners Checker uh, just outside of Bourne Hill, because that then was is probably the biggest piece of 
uh, archaeological excavation that I've undertaken in the city that's actually contributed to our understanding of the city. And since then, the archaeology of Salisbury has become more and more a part of my life, uh, become a bigger interest in me. So it's always very, very nice to actually feel that I think that's the important thing for me to feel that I'm actually contributing to the archaeology. I'm not looking at other people's research and the results of other people's work. I'm actually helping to contribute to that. I'm also I'm, I'm, and, and giving data to other people that they can benefit from. That's all very, very important. Mm, definitely. And and just on that note, um, somebody's noticed that you've been out and about filming in Salisbury recently. Um, does this kind of, you know, mean that we can expect something exciting uh, from you soon or is there new material coming? You can't move, can you? Not without somebody poking about seeing what you're doing. Um, the last bit of filming that I was doing actually um, I've done several bits of film in, in Salisbury. I suspect the most recent one was one that I was doing for a, a, a military charity, Waterloo Uncovered, which is looking at um, helping to rehabilitate uh, service personnel with PTSD and some with physical uh, disabilities that they've got through being in the, in the, in the forces. Um, and we go out or have been for the last five years out to the battlefield at Waterloo. And of course, this time we're in the lockdown, so we're having to have a virtual Waterloo uncovered. And I've been making two or three little films for their benefit. But I've also been doing a bit of filming work, work with Wessex Archaeology to try and promote the archaeology of Salisbury and also uh, to, to a, a bigger project to promote the archaeology of Salisbury through a, a bigger film format. Mm. And could you tell us a bit about that film project? Well, it's very much alive. It's something that we very, very much want to do because what I feel, uh, because like I say, I did my own little bit of excavating at the Vanners Checker. But because of that, then that started me to start looking at what had gone on before. And we realised that uh, Wessex archaeology in one form or another have been working in the city for 40 years. And over those 40 years, we have acquired an immense amount of information about the archaeology of the city. But what we've never actually done is joined it all together. And so we've got all these little tiny holes, if you like, all over the all over the city. And the conventional way to do it, and one of the things we have done is, is to produce a written document of almost a monograph, if you like, piecing it all together. But there are just so many ways now to get information over that film is another very, very useful one. And so the idea is, is to, to try and produce that into a, a film format, which would tell the story of Salisbury. And the crucial thing is it's telling the story of Salisbury through the archeology. span Now we will need to incorporate documentary resources as well. And, and in fact, there is a, a, a suggestion that one of the things we might be able to do is go into some of the documents, get them translated from the, the Latin, because I do I look like the sort of person who read Latin? I don't. Um, ne <laughs> yeah, God, I, my Latin teacher would turn in his grave. I bet he did. Poor devil, I gave him a hell of a time when I was at school. Language was, was not very one of my stronger points. Anyway. All these documents are in Latin. So what we're going to do is tr translate them and they list individual owners, individual people and what they did and where they lived. Now, you can take that information and then you can take the archaeological information that you've actually dug up and you found, you know where the foundations of a house are. 
you can actually go to a location and say the foundations for such and such a house are there. We know that because we've dug them up and then you can inject the people who live there. And that's what's so exciting. It's about the people that lived in Salisbury. I live in Salisbury. I am just another of uh, that long stream of residents who've lived in the city. And uh, what we're doing is trying to link me with that steady stream of people that have been going through since, well, since the, uh, the, the early 1200s. Ordinary people who've lived in the city, where they lived, what they did for a living, and then through the archaeology again, try and tell some about their lifestyle, the pots that they might have actually used, the foods that they would have eaten, and all that sort of thing, and trying to reconstruct a picture of Salisbury. You notice that I, the story that I'm telling is the story of a city. I haven't mentioned the C word yet, the cathedral, <laughs> That is it. So in other words, it's not a program. It's not a film about the cathedral. We, you, you can't ignore the cathedral, but it is not Salisbury, the cathedral. It's Salisbury, the city, Salisbury, the people that have lived here. Interesting. Well, that sounds really, really fascinating. And um, I think the other thing that we need to note is that um, there's a there's a crowdfunding effort towards this at the moment um, because you've partnered with a local filmmaker is that right? Absolutely we're we've we've sort of linked up with Exotentis who, who did the uh, Secret Spitfires uh, film which has been very successful in Salisbury a lot of people have seen that so Ets a, 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 a filmmaker it's not just Phil going out with his movie camera taking a, a bit of footage we have to have a bit of professional input into this and also of course in this day and age now it's all about um the illustration so do we got so much g computer generated imagery that we can throw into to actually bring the story to life but that costs money to put over brilliant and um i think we've now got a video which you've kindly uh, provided us with which will give our audience here um, a bit of a taster of what that film will include Salisbury, it's a beautiful city. The thing that sticks out above the skyline is always the spire. And what we got is something which goes back much, much further, right back into the dim, distant geological time. Because people have been living in this area for 300,000 years. What we see now is these beautiful rolling chalk downlands and in the bottom, the modern river systems. But 300,000 years ago, it was a totally different world. But we do have stone tools. Concentrated area of those is on Milford Hill, that these stone axe heads are actually found in gravel that were laid down by a river. And everybody knows the water does not flow at the top of a hill, it flows at the bottom of the hill. And so after about 10,000 years ago, people would have been moving in and out, up and down the Avon Valley. And we know they were here because yes, we've got yet more stone tools. Stone tools were found in the Churchfield Industrial Estate. We've got them near Peter's Finger. We've got them actually not very far away from the city centre itself in Fisherton Street. Just these little glimpses to show that people were here long before Salisbury ever existed. You've only got to go up to Stonehenge and the Salisbury Plain, you use barrows, burial mounds all over the place. People have been living around Salisbury for thousands and thousands of years. Most people think that archeologists dig up the dirt and throw it on the spoil tip. Not nowadays we don't. 
we bring large amounts of it back here to Wessex. Oh, sorry to interrupt. So uh, where's this little lot from then? This is from Cole's Hill, which is an HS2 site. And what are you hoping to find? We're looking for any environmental evidence. If this is all the thing that we're most interested in, but we'll look for anything that's left behind. Of course, this is the sort of information that we don't get, we don't find when we're digging. Absolutely no, because you only find it when you've cleaned it and looked at it under the microscope. But it, it might only be small stuff, but it really helps to fill in the gaps in the story of the site. And you can you can see what people were eating and how they were disposing of their food waste. And, um, you know, of course, this stuff has been preserved for thousands of years. The first really big, obvious monuments got to be Old Serum an Iron Age hill for massive display of strength and wealth and power. Think what happens when the Romans arrived here, when the Normans arrived here. By the time the Romans went, the Saxons then moved in. There are a number of Saxon burial grounds noted from around the area. He could be one of the first Saxon occupants of, of, of the Avon Valley, really. A bloke or a lady? In this case, we're pretty sure he's a male. Right. So yes, it's definitely a bloke. So he's been buried. He obviously had um, a shield, because we still got the shield boss there and a few bits of metal that were on there. Um, and there's the spearhead. So in that position, it suggests that the spear was complete when, um, yeah. when it went in. Pretty chronic injuries, in fact. If you look at these two shoulder blades, the scapula, right. you see the vast difference between the two. But still, Salisbury was not there. And that happens in the 1220s when the new city was formed. So, by the early 1200s, the cathedral at Old Serum had effectively outlived its usefulness. There were a list of reasons why the bishop was keen to move. It was windswept. The garrison were being a problem. So, he decided to move the cathedral down there. A perfect spot, made even better by the fact that he already owned the land. In the early 1220s, work began on the construction of the cathedral behind me. But there was no bells in the cathedral. The weight of those individual bells was too great for the tower. So they constructed a separate bell tower here. For the next 500 years, the bells chimed out with a clock to tell the time. Yeah, this is the uh, Salisbury Cathedral Bell Tower, so it doesn't exist anymore, but we've been looking at um, old paintings and etchings to try and reconstruct it as it was. That building was totally destroyed. You would never be allowed to knock a building like that down now, irrespective of what it was being used for. And then as the city grew, you began to get a planned city laid out on its familiar checkerboard pattern. The point is that we can reconstruct the development of Salisbury. What we're missing is a lot of the parts which have been knocked down. That is when archeology span starts to fill in the gaps. Behind me is a very familiar building, St. Thomas's Church. But what is not so familiar is the fact that at the moment, there are no pews inside. This major renovation work going on. But for an archeologist like me, this is a God-given opportunity to find out whether or not there's anything earlier than the church underneath. And how are we gonna do that? Geophysics. So finally, this is the great day. I feel that we are really, really contributing to the history, not only of this church, but of the city. And when we've actually got the survey completed and got all the data downloaded and analyzed, hopefully we will find the foundations of the earlier church on this site. So what we have here is the radar data and it's presented, so it's going to look at, this is the floor surface, and then we're going to go down in depth. So if I start scrolling down, you'll notice that these are 
towards the lines of the tombstones that are through the church. Yes. Yeah, these are the positions of the existing columns. And then if we keep going down, there's a specific depth which I find particularly interesting, which is about there. What we have here is what looks like stone pads forming a right angle at the corner of the building pad, <laughs> which maybe wooden beams might have sat on yes. for an earlier building. Yes. So what we're able to do now is to actually use archaeology as a bigger contributor in telling the story of Salisbury that one of the things that Salisbury was very famous for were these water courses through the middles of the streets. So here I am standing in the market square, the economic hub of the medieval city. And to get here, people would have had to bring in their livestock. This network of water channels was incredibly sophisticated, flushing water down through the streets of Salisbury. But for every advantage, there were disadvantages. How on earth are you going to get across them? They're going to need bridges. We've also got some superb early medieval buildings dating from the 14th century. That archaeology helps to build up the picture of what has happened in Salisbury, the evidence that we've lost. And believe me, the evidence has seriously been lost over the years. And so in a lot of cases, the archaeologists are trying to drag out and tease out these little threads of surviving information to tell the story. You take that bit of evidence, you interpret it, and from there you paint a picture. And for me, that painted a wonderful picture of what life must have been like in Salisbury. That looks absolutely amazing, Phil. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm really excited about that. Um, could you tell us how how we can get involved? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the most crucial thing is to try and get this funding. I mean, Wessex Archaeology have only got certain limited funds. So the more we can get through this crowdfunding, the better. Um, I can't give you any specific fancy web address, but I do know that if you Google uh, Salisbury Uncovered, that will supply you with a link. And believe you me, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Well, thanks so much, Phil. It's been uh, it's been really great chatting with you. Um, and thank you for answering all of those questions. Ah, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>